Good morning. Um, sorry for switching to English, but my Spanish is not uh, good enough to give a full talk in, in a full scientific talk in Spanish. Um, so um, thank you very much for the nice introduction, Alberto, and thank you very much for the invitation to come here. It's a pleasure to be here again. And uh, my talk uh, is uh, about Rosetta, which is a, sp a European uh, space mission to investigate a comet, in particular a cometary nucleus. And uh, I will present, as well as Alberto mentioned in his introduction, I'm heavily involved in this project. And um, I'm going to present uh, this mission, which will study uh, the cometary nucleus beginning in next year. And uh, my talk is uh, split into two parts. So the first part will give a very broad overview of what we know about comets, in particular what has been achieved with uh, space missions during the last uh, years, so to speak. So uh, let me start uh, with a brief outline. So I will start with, uh, as I said uh, already, with a brief overview of what we know about comets. I will uh, give a very brief uh, historical introduction and then talk about composition, orbits of the comets, and in particular origin and evolution. And I will give an inventory of uh, spacecraft uh, results. Then, of course, uh, the motivation for Rosetta, why do, and cometary research in general, so why do we study comets? I will briefly uh, talk about uh, why we go to uh, this cometary nucleus uh, with Rosetta, and then the second major part is uh, the space mission Rosetta itself. I will talk about the space a little bit about spacecraft and present the scientific instruments and what we are going to do at the comet. And here you also see um, the name of this uh, comet. It's Choyumov Gerasimenko. So it's a complicated name. So um, uh, usually comets are named after the uh, discoverer. And in this case, there were two people, Mr. Choyumov, a Russian guy, and Mrs. Gerasimenko from uh, Ukraine, who discovered this comet in uh, 1969. OK, um, what do we know about comets? So let me start with a brief uh, scientific uh, historical note. Uh, the most famous uh, comet is Comet Halley, which has a periodicity of approximately 76 years. Uh, so, um, and it has been recorded uh, it during historical times uh, going back for more than 2,000 years. There were the first records uh, from China, from Chinese astronomers, uh, f from around 240 before Christ, uh, who uh, have observed and recorded uh, uh, Comet Halley. And uh, interestingly, almost all later apparitions has, uh, have been recorded by Chinese or by other astronomers. So there's a very good record about the uh, uh, occurrence of uh, Comet Halley. So um, comets are usually considered as bad omen. And uh, for example, well, I have shown this uh, tapestry of uh, Bayeux. And you see uh, the c Comet Halley shown here. It, was, uh, the ba it occurred in 1066. And at that time, it was the bad omen of the conquest of England uh, by the Normans, uh, the, battle, the famous Battle of Hastings. And there's another no, uh, nice example where the comet is uh, surprisingly not considered as a bad omen. It's, uh, it's shown as a, as a good uh, event, which is very rare in historical records. And that's this nice fresco uh, in the chapel of uh, Scrovigny, uh, which, which has these nice frescoes by Giotto di Bondone from uh, 1305. And uh, these also show a comet, um, which you see over here. And uh, it may or may not be Comet Halley. So there is some, some debate whether it's, it's really a Comet Halley or another bright comet uh, that occurred a little bit later. Yeah, then um, I would like to mention uh, Edmund Halley, who discovered the periodicity of uh, Comet Halley in 1705. So he uh, investigated uh, earlier um, observations from earlier apparitions of the comet. And he noticed that there were 
uh, observations of the same comet which, which has the same heliocentric orbit and he thought that this must be the same uh, one and the same comet and he predicted uh, the next apparition but that unfortunately uh, well he he did not uh, see the comet at the next predicted apparition because uh, he died earlier unfortunately but his uh, prediction was right and the, name, uh, the comet was named after him because of this uh, nice uh, uh, work so then the last return so far was 1986 and actually a fleet of, of, of spacecraft was sent to Halley's Comet I will show also some results from those missions and here you see a nice picture of the previous apparition from 1910 when we talk about comets, I should uh, briefly introduce you uh, to what uh, comets uh, look like. And here I show a nice picture of comet Hale-Bopp uh, that shows, well, it was taken from the Earth and it shows the basic features uh, of a comet. So with the arrow I have indicated the cometary nucleus. This is invisible in this image because it's it's uh, too small. I've indicated the typical size of a cometary nucleus, 1 to 10 kilometers here, and it's it's covered in a big uh, uh, what the astronomers call coma of gas and dust. So imagine the cometary nucleus being made of mostly of ice orbiting the Sun. When it approaches the Sun it gets hot and uh, uh, gas evaporates, I mean water, uh, water sublimates and evaporates from the from the nuclear surface and uh, uh, this uh, gas forms the uh, uh, circular coma around the comet and this uh, coma has a diameter of approximately 100,000 kilometers which you see uh, approximately here and then uh, this uh, gas and dust particles are affected by the solar radiation and by the uh, solar wind. So the, the dust particles are driven out of the coma by the solar radiation and the solar wind pushes uh, the ions and transports the ions away from the cometary nucleus. And this is why the tails from of the comet usually point away from the sun direction. So the sun direction is indicated by these arrows and you have an iron tail and you have a dust tail. So the iron tail is uh, usually s opposite to the sun direction while the dust tail usually points uh, in, in a somewhat uh, different direction. This uh, comes about uh, due to the speed of the, of, of the dust particles which is much slower than uh, the ion speed. So here again uh, I show the coma approximately 100,000 kilometers. The tail, the gas, the iron tail uh, here this blue tail is uh, due to oxygen ions so it can be 50 million kilometers in size and also the dust tail has about similar size so actually comets are, um, are the biggest objects in the solar system so to speak but the tails are very very faint if the earth flies thr through sh uh, such a tail you won't recognize so here I have listed uh, uh, some facts uh, from well some facts about comets what we know just to give you an overview of some uh, recent results from the last uh, last several years. So usually the comets are considered as uh, dirty snowballs. What we think of what about the composition is that the cometary nucleus is formed to 85% approximately of water ice, then a few percent carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, nitrogen and we have minerals and uh, also organic compounds that have been detected. Cometary activity is driven by sublimation of water, sublimation of volatiles, mostly water ice but also CO and CO2 when the nucleus approaches the Sun. So uh, during each revolution about the Sun the nucleus loses about 1% of its mass. That also limits the lifetime of a cometary nucleus to about 100 or maybe somewhat more revolutions about the Sun. And then the cometary nuclei are surprisingly dark. That was a result from the uh, first cometary flyby in, uh, in, in 1986 at Comet Halley. So only 4% of the, in of the incoming light are reflected from the nuclear surface. So it's, it's, they, are the they are among the darkest objects in the, 
maybe in the universe or at least in the solar system we know of. So they are practically black. And this is still an enigma why this comes about. There are several theories, but this is still uh, still open. Then um, the density of several of, of a few cometary nuclei has been determined, and this is uh, only approximately 350 kilogram per cubic meter. So they are much lighter than water ice. So a cometary nucleus would swim on an ocean like an iceberg, but much more, uh, I mean a much larger percentage would be above the water than below the water compared to an iceberg because ice the iceberg is close to uh, 0.9 uh, or 900 kilogram per cubic meter in, in density. Yeah, and uh, another aspect which I also will come back is the comets are the most protein material left over from the formation of the solar system as far as we know today and this also makes it very interesting to study these objects because we can look back in his in the in history and time and see uh, and study the first stages of uh, planetary formation as i mean by studying comets and a word about the origin of comets they come from the kuiper belt and from the Oort cloud, which I will show you in the next slide in somewhat more detail, here I have shown several typical uh, cometary orbits. The astronomers distinguish between uh, Jupiter family comets with a, re a period about the Sun less than 20 years. A few examples are shown here, Temple 1 and Will 2. They both have been studied by spacecraft. And then we have the intermediate uh, or well, short short period comets, but intermediate uh, revolution period of 200 down to 20 years. A example is Halley's comet with an orbital revolution period of 76 years, and then we have the long period comets with more than 200 years period, and they and uh, they originate from different regions in the solar system. So we have the Jupiter family and short period comets that come from the Kuiper belt, which is a belt of uh, of small bodies uh, indicated by these blue dots here and that's uh, outside of Neptune's orbit. So it's, uh, it was discovered in the 1990s and in the meantime uh, many many I mean many th um, more than thousand objects uh, have been uh, identified there and, it's, and the estimate is that there are more than a million or, s or several million objects uh, in the Kuiper belt. And this is then a source for uh, short period comets. And if a, a comet uh, approaches Jupiter too closely, then the orbit is disturbed and it can become an even shorter period comet, a so-called Jupiter family comet. And the other group is the long period comets that come from the so-called Oort cloud. The Oort cloud is and the Oort cloud has not been observed directly because it's very, very far from uh, from the sun. It extends in the range of uh, several 10,000 astronomical units from the sun out to about 50,000 astronomical units. And the structure is illustrated here. So it's, a, it's a probably a spherical outer uh, cloud with more than bil uh, I mean billions of cometary nuclei and uh, some uh, flattened structure uh, that extends in the plane of the of the planets so the I should say that the comets were not formed in that region neither in the uh, Kuiper belt nor in the uh, Oort cloud they were formed further in in the uh, in the in the, s in the solar system and then later transported outward so also the Oort cloud is uh, so-called, well, so to speak, secondary uh, object or structure. And what I, would, wha what I also should mention is that the comets spend most of their time in very cold regions, either Kuiper belt or Oort cloud. They are cold at temperatures on the order of a few Kelvin, if we look at the Oort cloud, if maybe uh, 20, 30 Kelvin, Kelvin, if we look at the Kuiper belt, that means the material the very pristine material is deep frozen. It's the fridge of our solar system and the cometary material is basically unchanged. So that also makes it 
this is an important fact, and this also makes it interesting to study the comets because the material is really preserved. So, and then uh, how do we investigate comets? I have uh, shown this uh, illustration uh, just to illustrate the two basic possibilities we have. We either can use uh, a small, well, a small telescope like these uh, guys use, or big telescopes, but study the comets by observing from the Earth, like Comet Hale-Bob, uh, which is shown here. Or the other way is manufacturing a spacecraft, putting the spacecraft onto a rocket, shoot it into space, and go to the, uh, to the comet. And that's uh, what uh, we are do doing in our institute, in the Max Planck Institute for Solar System Re Research in Germany. And I will show you some results from uh, previous uh, space missions now. So I have talked a lot about cometary nuclei, but I have, haven't shown you one so far. So this is an inventory of uh, the cometary nuclei that have been visited by spacecraft um, so far. It's actually uh, only five comets. And uh, here in the upper right, uh, you see Comet Halley, which also is the biggest object. And uh, it was studied in 1986 by Giotto from, uh, from, from Europe. Then there were two uh, uh, missions from the Soviet Union, a Japanese mission and also a, a US mission that flew by. But Giotto was the closest. It went down to 600 kilometers. Uh, to the nucleus. And uh, I show you a short movie in the next slide of the flyby. And uh, here you see images of the other uh, cometary, uh, cometary nuclei. In particular, Temple 1 was the target of the deep impact mission by NASA. And uh, here, Hartley 2 was uh, investigated uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is, is a very nicely active uh, comet nuclei. Also, Haley was active during the flyby. You see this or, or this, this uh, blurring of the image. It's due to uh, gas emission. So um, here I show you the, uh, the movie from the flyby, which I will start in a moment. Here you see the scale uh, and uh, also the distance from the sun. It, it starts at 200,000 kilometers distance. And here is a sketch uh, of uh, how the nucleus uh, looks like. So I start the movie now. You see the scale and the distance uh, decreasing and the object becomes bigger and bigger. So the sun is illuminating the nucleus from the left. Gas is particularly emitted over here and over there, which is indicated by these uh, regions here. So now it, the, co the cometary nucleus fills the entire picture and I think the movie ends at about 1500 kilometers. So here you see some, some uh, surface structure but the picture is very blurred because of the, uh, because of the uh, gas emission. The comet nucleus was very active um, during that flyby. But I would like to show you one important result from that mission and that was an anal in, uh, this was, these are measurements from a dust spectrometer that was uh, on board the Giotto spacecraft, and it uh, detected dust particles and uh, measured the composition of the particles. And uh, here, in the, in the on the left, you see a plot of the elemental abundance. Uh, here you see uh, various um, uh, chemical elements that have been measured, and the the red symbols are the measurements from Comet Halley and the green symbols are measurements from the solar photosphere. So all this is normalized to magnesium. And uh, Halley's dust is also normalized to the composition of the uh, carbonaceous chondrites, a class of primitive meteorites. And uh, if you ignore the volatile elements here, which are abundant in the solar photosphere, you see that the abundances of the heavy elements agree very nicely between the cometary nucleus and the solar photosphere in particular and, and also with the, uh, with the meteorites, with the chondrites. So this, uh, was a, this proved that the comet, or at least this cometary nuclei that has been measured, uh, is primitive in the sense that it's unmodified 
uh, early solar system material because it has the same composition in heavy elements as the most primitive meteorites and also the same composition as the solar photosphere. So this was uh, uh, the proof that comets are really pristine, uh, un uh, unmodified objects. So then I will brief you sh briefly show you some results from the Stardust mission. Uh, Stardust flew by uh, comet Will 2, 2004 I believe, or 2006, I'm not quite sure anymore. Uh, I would have to check. Um, and the interesting thing is that Stardust uh, was successful in collecting dust grains from the coma of the comet and these grains were brought back to Earth and later analyzed in the laboratory. And here you see a, s a sketch of the spacecraft. Here you see the, the catcher. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it has about this size and it's filled with so-called aerogel. So aerogel is a very porous material which you see here. Uh, this guy is holding a piece of this, this material in his hand. It's very, very light. It's a type of foam and uh, when dust particles hit this aerogel they are decelerated and get stuck into this material. So you see it here from lab experiments and here you see a real impact from uh, one of the um, aerogel collectors that was uh, returned to earth. So here at the end of the trail uh, you see or here here you see the trail particle coming from the back side and got stuck at the end of the trail and the people could extract uh, such particles from this uh, silica material. So the typical size of these grains is on the order of 10 to 100 micron. And what came out of this analysis was uh, quite surprising. Uh, comets not only contained this very primitive material, also the, the minerals identified are quite refractory. That means high temperature phases uh, that must have formed in the inner part of the solar system. So during the formation of the solar system, you had a gradient in the in the in the disk that formed. Uh, I mean, in the disk that uh, where the, the where the planets formed, you had uh, you had higher temperatures up to 1,000, 2,000 Kelvin in the inner part, close to the sun or proto sun, and then in the outer at the outer uh, regions, you had temperatures where the comets could form, and these high temperature phases like these uh, calcium aluminum. Uh, in uh, fragments and uh, iron nickel sulfides, they form at temperatures above 1000 K. So that c was a clear indication that uh, there must have been radial transport and mixing in the pre-solar nebula. That material from the inner nebula was brought to the outer part and uh, then incorporated into the cometary material. Um, I'm now coming to uh, Comet Temple 1, um, which was actually the target of two spacecraft missions. The first uh, mission was Deep Impact in 2005. It uh, had an impactor like a projectile with a mass of 480 kilograms that was uh, shot onto the that was shot onto the nucleus. So this is a movie taken from the main spacecraft. You see this this bright uh, a spot uh, where the impactor hit uh, the comet and uh, the second movie shows um, uh, the, uh, the, the second movie was taken uh, with a camera on the impactor so you see the uh, flickering of the of the image cl uh, almost I mean uh, right before the impact and here you see an image where you see this uh, the emission so here the Roughly here is the crater, and a lot of material was uh, ejected, uh, a lot of dust in particular, and uh, uh, the amount of dust uh, that was ejected was estimated by observations from the Earth, and also the amount of water was estimated, and uh, this way also the size of the of the impact crater could be could be determined. So the, the diameter of the crater was estimated to be about 150 meters in diameter. And uh, much more uh, dust was ejected than, uh, than volatiles. So th this indicated that Temple 1 contained an unexpectedly large amount uh, of uh, uh, solid materials, of, of dust. So this is, uh, so the uh, cometary scientists 
up this uh, nucleus not an icy uh, in a dirty ice ball it's a, it's more like an uh, like an icy mud ball so you have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, solid material so this is uh, still in, still in in open debate there are some discrepancies apparently between different cometary nuclei so what was also possible for the first time from the deep impact flyby were studies of uh, the the surface structure so and i will explain this a little bit so there's some some so here's the scale so this is about 4 5 kilometers in length and uh, here you have some uh, smooth uh, regions like this one indicated by the arrows and also s here is some some very uh, smooth region it looks like uh, water was uh, molten and was flowing on the surface and then later frozen so this could be due to an impact but this is this is still an open debate and then you have some uh, some uh, cliffs which are indicated here by these arrows they are at, at the edge of this flat region I'm showing the I'm highlighting this because I'm coming back to this in one of my next slides so this is a cliff of about 20 or 30 meters high so you have an edge like uh, structure and then you have some uh, some structures that look like impact craters these ones or this one here and this arrow indicates the location of the uh, uh, the location where the impactor hit the surface. So then, yeah, in 2011 there was the opportunity to study uh, the say, I mean Temple 1 again by another spacecraft. So, and the interesting thing is that within these six years the comet had just one, had just made one revolution about the Sun. So one had the first opportunity to study uh, changes on the uh, nuclear surface due to the evaporation of volatiles and one could also look uh, for the impact crater and you see the re you see the region of the crater indicated here by this red circle this was this is an or these these uh, the middle and the right image were taken by the Stardust spacecraft that flew by uh, that collected these dust particles by the uh, by by the by another cometary nucleus um, and this is uh, the picture from 2005 by Deep Impact. So there are there's a time separation of of six years, and uh, the location of the impact crater is here. And uh, on the second image, you see some crater-like structure. It's hardly visible, uh, but it has a diameter of about uh, 200 meters. So that these these images confirmed the results from the Deep Impact measurements uh, from the uh, measurements of the of the dust cloud so the crater could be uh, really identified and in this view graph I show you again this cliff which I uh, pointed out uh, from the deep impact flyby it's indicated by these yellow lines here and here it's also again indicated uh, six years later and the the, uh, the structure of the cliff had changed so it has become uh, less steep apparently and also here the appearance of these crater-like structures has changed uh, significantly so this indicates that the activity of the cometary of the cometary nucleus is not driven by the entire surface it's it's mostly driven uh, on some spots some exposed places so to speak where you where there may be water ice uh, exp exposed to the s to the surface or where you have some uh, surface structures like these crater-like structures where you have uh, uh, edges and, and material exposed. So this was a very, a very interesting result and the final comment I would like to show you is uh, Hartley 2 which was visited in 2010 by the Deep Impact spacecraft so this was the spacecraft that uh, flew to Comet Temple 1 and here the interesting thing is that the nucleus was surrounded by ice balls. So each dot you see in this image, in this image here, is an individual ice ball, uh, the size of which was estimated to be uh, one to ten centimeters. It could be even larger. It depends on the 
on the albedo of uh, these balls, it could be even a few ten centimeters in size. And actually the trajectories could also be determined for some particles, and it turned out that many of them are orbiting the nucleus. So when we want to go to, uh, I mean, when we want to go with Rosetta to the cometary nucleus of chuyumov gerasimenko this might pose uh, a serious problem if we encounter such ice balls uh, as well. <coughs> and here um, is an image of uh, Hartley II that shows um, two different types of surface, surface structure or surface uh, cover. Um, first, the nucleus is not uh, round, it's more bone-shaped, and at the ends of this uh, bone you see some rough areas here and here, and in the middle there is uh, a very smooth area. So the interpretation is that um, dust material may have settled in this uh, smooth area uh, that, is, that was uh, driven up by the comet activity. And you also see here individual uh, jets, I mean places where this gas emission occurs, and this is also this was also for uh, for the first time uh, located on uh, the cometary nucleus. Um, the last image of Hartley II uh, shows um, the nucleus in the emission of different gases. So here you see uh, the emission of. Uh, H2O, of, of water vapor, which mostly comes from the center, the central smooth region of the nucleus, and uh, dust uh, seems to come from the entire nucleus, while CO2 in particular is preferentially ejected at one of these uh, edges here, at, the, uh, at one of the edges of the, uh, of the bone, which is illuminated by the sun. So apparently different gases are ejected from different parts of the nucleus, which indicates that the composition also varies, that we have some parts with water ice, other parts with, uh, with uh, CO and CO2. I briefly uh, show you um, this slide. So, uh, so far I've talked a lot about uh, dust. I should also briefly uh, mention the composition of the gas that was measured in situ and also from the ground, from the earth. So here you see an inventory of uh, um, gas molecules that have been identified in, in the in cometary coma. So you, ha <coughs> you have, of course, water, CO and CO2, and you also have uh, quite a lot of organic compounds that have been identified. And interestingly, glycine, the smallest amino acid, uh, the smallest amino acid that's found in, in proteins, uh, was identified in the Stardust samples from uh, Comet Will 2. So this uh, uh, this was was very exciting because this may be some of the precursors for life. So okay, so far I gave you an, a very broad overview of um, how the cometary nuclei appear and. Uh, uh, what's and about the composition in particular. Now I'm coming to the Rosetta mission and before doing so I will uh, show you uh, the three basic or major questions which I have tried to condense here uh, why we are studying comets and uh, one major driver is how do comets work the development of activity, in particular the development of jets. I have shown you this surface changes w which give some indications uh, that uh, how this might work, but there are still uh, many open questions which we want to study in detail. Um, then uh, the surface structure and evolution and the distribution of activity regions on the surface and in particular the lifetime of comets. It's still an open debate. The question whether these uh, circular structures are craters or uh, structures formed f uh, during, uh, due to the activity uh, is closely related with this. And of course I could extend this uh, uh, quite a lot. Then the second question, how did comets and the solar system form? By studying in particular the composition of the material, I mean the elemental composition and, and uh, uh, internal in the internal structure, we hope that we can 
better understand how the cometary nuclei formed. And then the third uh, question, did comets bring water to Earth? And possibly also, did comets bring building blocks of life to Earth? And here in particular, it's interesting to investigate the organic and the isotopic uh, composition uh, that we uh, will encounter in the dust particles. So this is just a very brief uh, summary of the motivation why we go to comets. And now I would like to uh, introduce the Rosetta mission to comet churyumov gerasimenko And uh, briefly, where does the name Rosetta come from? Uh, the Rosetta stone that was found in, Nor in northern Egypt uh, by the troops of uh, Napoleon in 1799. And it, it formed the major piece for deciphering the Egyptian hieroglyphs. It contains one and the same text in three, uh, written in three alphabets, in Greek, in hieroglyphs, and in the later Egyptian uh, language, and it, f it formed, uh, it, it was key to understanding the hieroglyphs. And the cometary scientists think that the comets are also key to understanding the formation of the solar system, and that's why they gave uh, this mission the name Rosetta. So here you see an, a sketch, a drawing of uh, the spacecraft. It has a size of approximately three by three meters, like a cube, and here you see uh, solar cells. The, uh, ma ma the, the main antenna has a diameter of about two meters, and here th is a second spacecraft which uh, Uh, is carried piggyback uh, with the orbiter and it's supposed to land on the cometary nucleus uh, in November next year. Uh, here you see a sketch of the orbit which I will show uh, in more detail in a moment. Here is, uh, is the spacecraft during manufacturing. Just to give you an idea of the size, so here are two uh, engineers or technicians. Uh, here you see some uh, older computers and here you see is the spacecraft with the solar arrays uh, folded together. They have a length of, I think, 32 meters uh, if they are unfolded. And again, here the um, main antenna for communication with the Earth. A few numbers about the spacecraft. Um, I also already mentioned the size. The energy is produced purely with uh, solar arrays. European missions do not carry uh, Uh, nuclear uh, energy generators uh, do not carry RTGs, so ESA missions rely on uh, solar cells for energy production. That, of course, makes it difficult to go uh, to the outer solar system. Um, the total mass of the spacecraft is uh, 2,900 kilograms, and more than half, more than 50 percent of this is fuel. Science instruments is about 165 kilograms, and the lander on its own uh, adds about 100 uh, kilograms of math. The lifetime is uh, uh, designed for 12 years. This table lists the scientific instruments on board the orbiter. So we have a long list of uh, 10 or 11 uh, instruments on the orbiter alone. We have an optical camera, we have infrared, we have an infrared camera, we have an, a UV camera and spectrometer. We have a microwave spectrometer. We have a gas mass analyzer, which uh, gives uh, high resolution uh, time of flight spectra from uh, the volatiles in the coma. We have a dust mass spectrometer, uh, with wi which we use, uh, which I'm also involved in, and which we use uh, to analyze dust grains. So we will collect dust grains from the coma and analyze uh, the grains with a time of flight secondary ion mass. Uh, analyzer. Uh, there is a very, uh, very sensitive atomic force microscope that will measure the structure of uh, submicron sized dust particles. Um, we have nuclear sounding that will uh, investigate the internal structure um, uh, like, an, like you use, uh, similar to, to, to an X-ray instrument you use in, in medicine where you see the internal structure of a human body, for example. Uh, this is a microwave or radio wave sounding experiment that will investigate the internal structure of the cometary nucleus. And then we have a dust flux monitor and also plasma instruments. So this is just a very brief overview. We have a, f a, a large uh, suite of instruments uh, so that we can 
investigate the comet, fr uh, the comet nucleus from, from very different perspectives. And here you see a sketch, a drawing of the lander. Um, it has about a size of one meter or one meter fifty, and the diameter of the legs is also approximately 1.5 meters. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a large device. It is covered also with solar cells uh, for energy production. Uh, during flight, it is connected to the orbiter here at this point. And then um, there are, well, I these three LEDs, of course, will make the connection with a cometary nucleus. There are drills in the, in the legs that will, uh, that hopefully will help fixing the lander uh, to the nuclear surface. And there are also harpoons, no, which are not indicated here, but they are also at the bottom of, of the lander. They, they will anchor the lander to the nuclear surface. And here are also some instruments indicated, which I will uh, not discuss in detail. Again, uh, here's a, a table listing all these instruments. We also have uh, cameras again. We have an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer uh, to investigate uh, s uh, soil material. We have a gas analyzer. It's a gas chromatograph. Actually, we have two gas analyzers on board, one for the elements and, uh, and molecule composition, and one specifically design, uh, designed for measuring isotopes. We have cameras uh, which, which give high-resolution images from the soil and from the surroundings, a panoramic, a, a panoramic camera. We have a dust flux monitor on board the lander that will measure dust particles that are released from the uh, surface and will fall back to the nucleus, uh, yeah, fall back to the nucleus, or th that will also directly hit the sensor. Um, we, ha we have a drill that will drill down into the soil uh, to approximately half a meter and it will measure the temperature also during day and night variation, the temperature cycle, and will also measure or determine uh, the material properties of the soil, the hardness for example. We will also measure the, the electrical properties and the permittivity of the soil. We have a magnetometer. Uh, yeah. So this, so again, the lander is a uh, co a complicated spacecraft on its own, also equipped with a large uh, suite of uh, instruments. So this is just to give you an overview. Yeah, and now I'm coming uh, uh, to the um, mission and the, tra and the trajectory. So Rosetta was launched nine years ago uh, on the 2nd of March 2004. It uh, was brought on an interplanetary so here I should mention that you see again the lander uh, uh, while it's being attached to the orbiter here you get an idea of the size of the lander on its own and uh, Rosetta was brought on an interplanetary trajectory and uh, it will reach the comet in, in May next year or a bit later there will be uh, maneuvers to reach uh, to approach the comet so here you see the trajectory. It's a bit complicated in this plot. I will only mention the major highlights. So we have the launch in 2004. Then we had three Earth flybys, uh, one Mars flyby. So these flybys were necessary uh, to get uh, to gain energy. These were swingbys at the uh, at the terrestrial planets. And uh, then uh, after these swingbys, uh, Rosetta had enough energy to reach the asteroid belt. There were asteroid flybys at Lutetia and Steins in uh, 2008 and 2010. Then the spacecraft went back to the inner solar system again. And then uh, you see here this uh, dotted trajectory. Then it reached, then it approached the, uh, the trajectory of comet Chuyumov Gerasimenko, which you see in red here. And we have um, two mission highlights we have the rendezvous in next May, May 2014. And we have the, um, the landing of the lander in mid-November next year at a heliocentric distance of approximately uh, three astronomical units. So all these maneuvers, uh, these flybys, were necessary because we, we needed to 
a reach uh, the cometary nucleus on the same trajectory. We want to fly, we want to land, and we want to follow uh, the comet. That needed a lot of energy and in order to get the same uh, trajectory as the cometary nucleus. All the earlier missions, which I showed you previously, were flyby missions. So, you, so the spacecraft just uh, pointed close to the nucleus and made a high-speed flyby with between 6 and uh, 60 uh, kilometers per second, really high-speed flybys. And when you do a fl uh, when you do a flyby, you uh, do not you don't normally do not need these complicated maneuvers. So this was also the reason why we needed 10 years of interplanetary flight before we can reach uh, the comet. So here's a nice picture from Mars from the Mars flyby. You see uh, the space. This uh, picture was taken from. Uh, the lander with a lander camera, you see the spacecraft body over here, and you see uh, the back side of the solar arrays, and here you see Mars and the uh, the um, the horizon of Mars. Um, here you see images of the flybys at the asteroids. Uh, these were um, one rather small asteroid, and these big. Uh, piece of rock here, Lutetia, in the main belt. They are covered uh, with craters, and you also see some, some smooth areas on the surface, which I don't want to uh, discuss in detail. And then I come to our destination, uh, Churyumov Gerasimenko. And in this slide, I give a very brief overview, summary, of what we already know about the cometary nucleus from Earth-based uh, investigations. So here you see a shape uh, or shape model. Uh, this model was derived from light curve observations from the Earth and uh, it gives you a rough idea of how the uh, nucleus uh, looks like. So the diameter is approximately four kilometers. We know the rotation period quite well. It, uh, the rotation period is 12.5 hours and the orbital revolution about the Sun is uh, 6.5 years approximately and uh, it approaches the Sun down to 1.24 astronomical units uh, 1.24 astronomical units, sorry, uh, which is approximately the distance of the Earth from the Sun. And uh, the, ap the aphelion, the farthest point from the Sun is beyond Jupiter's orbit at 5.6 astro astronomical units and what's important to note, Jup um, Chuyumov is a Jupiter family comet. It was brought into the present orbit in uh, 1959 uh, due to orbital um, disturbances by Jupiter. Before that, it was further away from the Sun. In particular, the perihelion was higher. That means uh, Chuyumov is rather fresh, as far as we know. That means it had only a few flybys through the inner solar system, few modifications of the material occurred, and surface changes were relatively, uh, moder re relatively low. That means it, it's, it is very likely really fresh material, uh, not changed much since its formation. So here you see uh, the landing of uh, Rosetta, of the Rosetta lander. The orbiter will go down to five kilometers to the nuclear surface, which is well approximately right in this uh, illustration. And then it will release the lander. The lander will go down to the surface during approximately three to five hours. This is not yet fixed, so this is still in the planning phase. And the lander will land autonomously. So it does not have an active um, a propulsion system. There's only one small uh, Prop, um, one small engine at the top of the lander, uh, which is indicated here. Uh, so, it, so after landing, it will make it can push down the lander to the uh, to the surface to pre to prevent it from uh, hopping. So imagine the uh, the gravity of the nucleus is really weak. It's a four kilometer object. The escape speed is on the order of one to one point five meters per second. So that means if you jump, if imagine you are standing on the nuclear surface and you jump, 
then you leave this, the, the gravity of, uh, of the nucleus. And if the spacecraft goes down with, uh, with a large, with a residual speed that is more than 1 or 1.5 meters per second, it hits the surface and will also jump and uh, go off the nucleus again. So that means the residual speed has to be very low and right after landing we need an anchoring system. And this is done by two harpoons that I already mentioned, and also to some extent by this uh, small uh, engine. So this is a really tricky landing maneuver, and the details are, s are still not yet fixed. So the, the engineers, the people, are still uh, working on this. So here you see how it will uh, look like in November next year, hopefully. Um, the life, or in this sketch, you see the orbiter above the lander. So the plan is that the lander will operate on the nuclear surface for hopefully up to three months after landing. And during this time, the orbiter will uh, stay close to the nucleus and uh, there will be joint measurements with instruments on both lander and orbiter. And the orbiter will also work as a relay station for transmitting data, uh, I mean, for communication between lander and Earth both ways. Um, yeah, and this uh, slide uh, summarizes the operation at the comet. So, as I mentioned, in May we will have a rendezvous maneuver to approach, to really approach the, uh, the comet. In, uh, in July or August we will go into, into an orbit about the nucleus, which will be on the order of 100 kilometers first. It will then, the orbiter will then go further down and uh, make a mapping, a detailed mapping, high resolution mapping within three months. Uh, within these three months, a landing site has to be found and uh, selected. And then uh, in October, the spacecraft, the orbiter will go closer to the nucleus and then release the lander in probably mid-November. Then uh, the orbiter will stay close to the nucleus and follow the nucleus during approach to the sun. During the uh, during landing, uh, the comet will be at three astronomical units. It will most likely already be uh, rather active, emitting gas and dust. But the activity will certainly increase when it approaches the sun. And this, or, or, I mean, all this uh, development of activity will be monitored by the orbiter. And the operation will hopefully uh, continue until the end of uh, 2015, when the comet uh, moves away from the sun again. So this is a very, brief, a very quick, very brief overview of uh, the mission. And uh, this slide is a summary. Uh, I try to summarize, to summarize the main points of my talk. So the comets are the most pristine material left over from the formation of the solar system, which makes it very interesting uh, to study. They are considered dirty snowballs, although there's some debate. They are very porous, interestingly. Uh, they are very dark. They contain organic substances. And the driver of the activity is the evaporation of volatiles, mostly water ice, from the surface. Um, they may be building, them, or they may have brought building blocks for the formation of life from space. And as I told you, uh, Rosetta will be the first mission to land on a cometary nucleus to perform in situ studies on the nuclear surface and uh, the orbiter will follow the, uh, the cometary nucleus for approximately one and a half years. Thank you very much.